Well, we had a slight weird little interruption. And I'm trying to restart for the benefit of people who are hanging on here. I'll have to tell everybody where I'm at again. And most annoying, most annoying. Let's get rid of that. Okay, now. Okay, technically we are just starting up the uh, show again. Tell everybody where the hell it is because uh, there was a fart at um, old of YouTube for Twitter so that I can let everybody know. Okay. Um, come on. Um, because until everybody knows where I'm at, nobody's actually watching. Well, Just about ready to send them some information out there and see what happens, and he'll have to connect up with everybody. We're at 5.05. Uh, pardon for the delays and screw-ups, ladies and gentlemen, out in video land. point was to discuss uh, systematic taxonomy, dogs, dog, and how much do you have to change to not be a dog anymore. The problem with systematics is that it is, in principle, these binomial systematics that you find in the old Linnaean system, is that it's either one or the other, and it can never be. And so it has trouble, in principle, dealing with intermediates and transitionals. It isn't as though they don't exist. It's that they become vague. You get something pigeonholed. Just imagine you were doing a, a, a video collection and you had to peg every single movie in only one category, never another category. Some people, wow, have you found us? Eee. Okay, here we go. Got some people floating around. All righty. Um, anyway, imagine you were trying to make a video collection. And everything has to be categorized as only one thing. So you've got uh, dramas and comedies, and you've got science fictions, and you've got uh, mysteries and uh, uh, musicals and whatever. How do you deal with a movie like The Great Race from 1965? A comedy, and so by definition, it files in the comedy category. Except Natalie Wood at one point sits down and sings a song, uh, The Sweetheart Tree, and uh, there's an orchestra playing, and there's no orchestra there on the stage. So it's technically a background, uh, not source music thing. Uh, does that make it a musical? Plus, there's another number that actually takes place in a bar. Uh, so you got two musical numbers, at least, in the story. Uh, is it a musical, then? Uh, well, remember, you can only classify it as either one or the other, and you wouldn't really classify it as a musical because it's mainly a comedy, blah, blah. So... That same problem is what afflicts taxonomy when you deal with something that's in the transitional zone. And uh, various uh, systematists have pointed out, for example, what do you do with birds? When you go far enough back before Archaeopteryx, uh, you're now starting to classify things as what? Um, dinosaurs? And where exactly do you draw the line before it becomes a bird? With uh, mammals where uh, the synapsids are reptile -y for quite a long time until they're less reptile -y and then less reptile -y and then they're even more mammalish and more mammalish and then finally there's the one where you decide because of the way the jaw hinge connects up that's the defining characteristic bingo you got a mammal but you still had a long wind up so um 
in the case of a dog, imagine over a million, 10 million, 100 million years, some lineage of canis eventually develops uh, web, uh, webbed membranes and flies around like a bat. It would still be canis flappicus, but it would still be in the same taxonomical category because it's still part of that lineage. Yeah. Um, but when you get into transition zones, you start getting squishy. And uh, there was a, a, I'll cue up my thing to read from because it meant a nice little bit about uh, Brian Hall. And I put a reference into the original version of this, but since we were on a super duper rapid thing, I'll have to put the references to all that in after I update the file once it's edited. Uh, sorry, gang. Uh, Brian Hall had done a paper in 1992 on um, Waddington and the uh, implications of systematics and other things. And he noted that trying to classify things by easily characteristics is that there's way more variation than you might think. And he pointed out that in the sea urchin genus, not even high up, um, Heliosideris, uh, that over the last 10 to 12 million years, it had, uh, had so many variations in it that they were, quote, comparable to those that distinguish classes and phyla, determinate versus indeterminate cell divisions, mode of gastrulation, and cell cleavage pattern. Um, some of the phyla have had to be split and others lumped together over the years as they've improved their understanding of the systematics. And so the, the idea of that, there's a nice, neat box where you could theoretically have fixed kinds, or for that matter, fixed species, it just doesn't work basically unworkable because everything is one gigantic natural branching lineage over time. How you systematize it, what box you put them in taxonomically, depends upon the contingencies of history. Um, as this cladistic systematist would be fond of pointing out, uh, even though we all know what a fish looks like, fish is not a natural group from a cladistic point of view because a fish taxonomically would be, as a clade, would be the fish and every descendant of it, which would not only include fish, but also all the tetrapods and us and dinosaurs and birds and everything else. But normally if you go down to the Kentucky Fried Fish Store and order the fish, when what you mean is the dinosaur, oh, I'm sorry, the chicken, um, they wouldn't have an idea what you were talking about. So what hierarchy you use, what level you decide to pick as the zone of classification will color your interpretation in part because you got to pick it either one or the other. And we've got people going on about hump day and so forth and so on. Uh, we, we hit the hump day here where I had to restart. And uh, I suppose I still need to get some things where I can point out to people. Um, let me... I will throw caution to the bloody effing wind and put the damn hangout here directly on the feed. And anybody who has the camera um, can uh, and uh, join the conversation because uh, I, I had I had it all set up. It was all just perfectly fine. But to my mind, that point about um, lumpers versus splitters in taxonomy. And uh, we find it today as to the dispute about how many species of giraffe there are. And we find it in older taxonomy as to how many species of triceratops there were. Uh, and all of this, it all hinges on the fact that nature is squishy, that species can vary enormously while still being able to interbreed. Ring species form that phenomenon. And what you're trying to do when you're dealing with, with extinct life forms, especially ones that you don't have living examples to go by developmentally and biologically and genetically, is you're trying to do the best you can to make sense out of them all. Creationists, when they come into this frame, and the intelligent designer is even worse because they don't even bother about systematics. They could care less about it. The, the creationists at least try to kind of work out kinds once in a while. Yeah, the, the B.J. Price, yes, the, the pointed out, settle, there are four species of giraffe, at least for the moment. And uh, we'll see, because I know there was an awful lot of pushback about that paper and from a variety of areas. And uh, um, the, the major thing is that, that anybody who looks at systematics should always be expecting these squishy zones, because populations are not indeterminate blobs. They're, they're individual organisms that live in populations that spread over spatial relationships. And there's 
deems and avatars as the gene flow is occurring both between the, uh, uh, the main genes and also the mitochondrial genes that, that a lot of the things in hybridization zones in chipmunks that have been studied as one example up in my neck of the woods, where unless you include all of that mitochondrial DNA, you can't really explain why the hybridization zones are producing zygotic isolation the way they are because the mitochondria is playing a part of the role. Ah, uh, let's see the, uh, does the giraffe kind include the okapi kind? Yeah, that, uh, actually, I don't think the creationists yet, if BJ was asking, I don't think the creationists have gotten to most of the critters. Um, about the, ironically, the uh, intelligent design guy, Lunig, uh, has done a, a, a lot of quibbling on the, the giraffe, but he doesn't tell us whether it's related to anything else or not. This is true also, by the way, of, of Michael Behe and Michael Denton, who theoretically accept speciation. They've done it in their books, but yet they never use it for anything, ever. Uh, and so it's, it's a tool that keeps in the, the shed because they never apply it to anything. Creationists, by contrast, are forced into kind of working out what kinds are because they have a non-negotiable box to fill, and that's the ark. And they have to physically account for how many kinds there are now and how many kinds were created and how many went from there to what we actually see today and the problem is they got way more species than they got booking places so they've got to run amok to try to figure out how to whittle down the kinds to fit on the ark and then expand them out again after the flood in only 4500 years or less <coughs> that's an intractable problem for them um, Remember, all the data that the regular systematics people are dealing with still is out there. Every single fossil, every single uh, population genetic study, uh, all of that data still has to be accounted for in any non-evolutionary framework. Creationists are so slow to deal with it and so contradictory. they got to flush data down the drain big time in order to be able to make even a, a stab at kinds. Uh, and then the intelligent designers don't deal with it at all. Now we're getting some, some snarky comments over in the peanut gallery here. Uh, we're, we're, we're wanting to piss on Ham's grave. We'll be too soon to make fun of it. Uh, are we talking about Ken Ham, the, the wonderful avatar of intelligent design and creationism from Answers in Genesis, the purveyor of the ark, the man that looks like a freeze-dried biblical patriarch who's been left out in the rain a little bit too long. Um, and... Um, uh, uh, Ken, he's sort of Kent Hovind with more charm, which is a quirky thing to say. Um, Ham is only a part of the framework. The answers in Genesis certainly acts as a conduit for an awful lot of the current breed of creationists. In fact, I, I'm inclined to think that they're a bit more active dynamically than uh, Institute for Creation Research, although there's an awful lot between the two. You've got a lot of writers who will be writing for one thing and then the other, and then some of them will leak over Ministries International all the rest. It's a relatively small club. Remember that all the fact claimants in all of anti-evolutionism, there's only about 50 of them, and about two-thirds of them are young earth creationists, and the rest, a uh, third, about a dozen, are uh, intelligent design advocates, and it's not a lot of people. So they've only got so many venues, and they schmooze and interconnect. Ham isn't kosher. Yes, indeed. There, there is the ham kind, B.J. Press, uh, Price says, yes, in the side comments. Um, they're enormously influential. If you looked at intelligent design when it was first coming in in the 1990s, it sounded like they were kind of going to be the replacement creationism to kind of push them off the boundary layer and all of the wonderful scholastic collegiate types uh, that don't have younger creationism to defend would take over, but yeah, it hasn't worked that way. Intelligent design remains a convenient uh, niche market that gets fed on by anti evolutionists, uh, carefully fed on by young earth creationists because they know that uh, uh, the typical uh, intelligent design advocate is not a young earth creationist, and so they're very wary. Plus, some of them are old school. Uh, uh, anti-Catholics and that, you know, the, the traditional King James only uh, Protestants. And so the fact that Michael Behe is a Roman Catholic is yet another little problem. 
Um, the same thing would apply to Jonathan Wells because he's a unification church minister and all that. So the, the doctrinal creationists have to be kind of wary. And so you can kind of tell who's in the club by who gets published right up front. So anybody who appears in any of the AIG or ICR publications by definition is one of the club. They're fully doctrinal young earth creationists, even if they're not writing about explicitly young earth creationist subject matter. They, they fit within the box in that frame. Um, point, and they're supported by idiot politicians. Yes, indeed. Uh, that, um, that is part of the problem we are seeing in the current administration where there have never been more um, anti-evolution friendly uh, science challenged people in positions of power that are going to be making policy for um, the gang. Uh, if you happen to be living in, in uh, HUD housing projects, you are going to have decisions made for you by uh, Ben Carson, who is a young earth creationist and thinks that pyramids were built as Joseph's granary, which is a blast from the past if you were dealing with hot topic 1840s apologetics, but boy, it's just nonsense here now. Um, Fino asks, do they need to sign Ham's I Am Delusional wa uh, waiver just like the cashiers and uh, orderlies of the Ark encounter? Uh, well, but they don't see it as delusional. They see it as a reflection of what they believe to be God's word, and that trumps everything else. That automatically overrides mere science uh, and the like. And... Um, if you have the kind of mind that can appeal to authority, that can accept things and you don't really bother checking any of it out, uh, then it's an easy thing to sign off on. Um, you can be very bright and competent in many areas, but there's an object of desire you want to be true and you're going to stick with it. If, however, you have a mind that really is kind of an inquiring type and is going to want to check the stuff out, it's not an easy task to maintain your young earth creationism without things fraying. And that's where you can see this process going on at the source methods level to see what it is they're paying attention to and what they don't. Um, Paul the Skeptic points out there, they do have some kind of oath or something. Both the Institute for Creation Research and the Answers in Genesis to have the ones that are uh, um, uh, writing for them, and for that matter a great many very conservative Christian colleges, have actual doctrinal statements of faith that people who teach there or uh, are planning on learning there or publishing under their imprimatur um, have to abide by. And it's a non-negotiable for them. Uh, you don't find that going on amongst intelligent design friendly ones because there really is no set ideology of intelligent design other than a Darwinism bad and the rest of it's kind of um, peripheral. So there, it, it's squishy or over in that end. Um, see what other little comments are going along in there that they do not see that pledge as insane uh, doesn't mean it is not. Well, it, it, I, I don't like to use the word insane. I would use the, the term tortugan. And it all boils down to, do you have a mind that doesn't think about things it doesn't want to think about? And will focus in on objects of desire that you really do need to be true. You want it to be true. And you only pay attention to things that reinforce what it's true, and you don't really bother allowing it not to be true. So the, the mechanism of here is the evidence would cause you to change your mind, literally their minds don't think about that. I test that out all the time regarding transitional forms, because um, what I discovered in my tip research was I literally could find no instance anywhere in 150 years of anti-evolution writing where anybody that was disbelieving in a transitional would explain what it needed to look like for them to say, no, that would be a transitional. And when you find that level of consistency in the pattern, um, then you can see that this is how easy it is for them to not see transitionals. Nothing can be a transitional in principle, and their brain will find whatever it is they need to latch on to. Uh, the same thing goes for their religious apologetics. If they can manage to overlook the internal contradictions in the Bible, then whoop, it's easy peasy uh, for them to uh, get over the rest of it. So what we're looking at is a cognitive process and the mechanism by which they deal with information. Um, Fino brings up uh, uh, the, the uh, Kent Hovind's doctoral thesis. Yeah, that one is a real rip tickler. Um, it's... Um, is notorious in the creationism criticism circles 
of the fact that um, it was a long time while well, it wasn't made public. And then, of course, he keeps on editing and revising it, which, of course, you can't do with a thesis. It's supposed to be cast in concrete once you get it. Plus, it was for uh, Patriot University, which operates out of a kind of a shed um, rural uh, Colorado to this day. I mean, they actually still are a, a university. Uh, technically speaking, they are more of a university than Trump University because Trump University is shut down, but Patriot University isn't. Uh, and it's um, effectively uh, uh, not a mail order thing because they have a sort of campus, but they do a lot of the stuff not really by people going to it. And um, uh, heck, if I, if, if I wanted to set up a PhD program and, and a fake university like that, I could give one myself. But no, I, I stuck with a real live normal BA in history and that's all I have and I, I'm running with it as much as I uh, have on it. Um, are there any uh, questions out in the uh, the gallery about this systematics notion or the notion of kinds, barominology? Um, what it means to have taxonomical discontinuity, how you would deal with creationists on it, what problems you might have had. That's what I'd hope somebody might have jumped in. We could have had a, a, a direct chit chat uh, going on here to kind of go over background on these things. As much as I love to talk as the monologue, I also enjoy um, reactions. Um, it says, though ironically, every fossil is a transitional fossil that happens to be the last of its species. Yeah, I, I am very fuss potty in the use of transitional because what I deem it to mean is something which is clearly an intermediate in a thing that where you have the A and the B, and the B is something very different from the A. You get from one to the other, you need some kind of transitional thing. If you have a lineage that remains relatively stable, coelacanths, for example, um, that were thought to have gone extinct you know, 60 million years ago at the time of the Cretaceous uh, extinction, but it turned out, nope, they were still plucking along little bits of them in the Indian, Indian Ocean. They are uh, your classic living fossil, not unchanged genetically, and in fact, they've got a lot of lessons to tell about the origin of early tetrapods, and there's a lot of stuff that you can glean even from the genetics of the living coelacanths, which they now have done. Uh, but it's still coelacanthy. And uh, so it's, it has a different weight when you're talking about a transitional form than it is when you're looking at the reptile mammal transition or the origin of birds or transition from land mammal to whale uh, or the origin of bats, flying animals, pterosaurs, and all of that. Because now you get something really big league. And uh, even the horse sequence is relatively low scale macroevolution compared to something like uh, the... Um, uh, reptile mammal transition, whales, and that sort of thing. Now, you'll notice the whale transition still taking place within the chordates and vertebrates. Um, and no matter how much variation occurs, they're still going to be classified as the chordate file. they got a notochord, uh, and uh, so long as it retains that feature, it's going to be classified as a chordate no matter what it looks like, no matter how varied it is. No matter how much it may develop hair or feathers or echolocation or all of these disparate things that have come up, they're still taxonomically chordates. And that's why bringing up the origin of the phyla in the Cambrian explosion is a dangerous proposition if you know how to play the counter argument is that what creationist acknowledges a phylum as a type or a kind? They actually won't think that, well, we're all just a member of the chordate phylum and nothing much has changed since. No, 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 no. They, they can't allow that high level taxonomy of being created kinds. They've kind of got to go below that level and typically at the family level, except for us. So knowing where the real systematics and taxonomy is and knowing where creationists are and how they're not bumping into it improves your ability to interact with them. If anybody loves nature, uh, if, you, if you love living forms, you can deal with things you're familiar with. So if you are a dog lover, you can look up a little bit more about the research of the dogs and the canids generally, and then the uh, felids, their close cousins, and the myocids, you know, work your way back 10 or 20, 30 million years, kind of be familiar with a little bit of the fossil data and the stuff on that that you can use to undermine the claims, well, they're still just cats and or still just dogs. If you're more of a fossil geek like I am, then you can take a look at the fossil data where it's harder 
to identify direct species species connections not impossible there are examples but typically more difficult so you're looking at it more at the genus and then sometimes at the family level if you only have a few examples but you can still find intermediates and transitionals probiotic nathids obvious transitional predicted in advance Sphico mirma, the wasp ants were predicted in advance. In many respects, Tiktaalik uh, had features that were predicted in advance. So, and they certainly were going into certain rock deposits to find them, uh, based upon evolutionary uh, biogeography and the like. So, the fact that paleontology and zoology and that can become, in effect, predictive tools with evolution has to contrast with anti-evolutionism that never can predict a damn thing. They can only kind of sort out little bits and pieces of what you actually find. Uh, oh, yes, paranormal, uh, uh, a uh, uh, nice headset. This is a gift from uh, uh, Jackson Wheat, who uh, FedExed this to me. I can't afford to buy a damn thing, so uh, the fact that this was a freebie on his part, I thank him very profusely for that. And um, that allows me to turn my microphone uh, on and the uh, uh, speakers off and make it easier on everybody except when YouTube screws up and we have to start over again. Uh, let's see what we've got in here from high up. Countered creationists who seem to think evolution flips a switch to produce a new family in order and you have to explain to them that these are human defined categories not genes. Exactly. Uh, that the one thing that can be clearly said, the old arguments that Gould would offer sometimes in the 70s and 80s about uh, saltationism and all that. It's just a dead letter. We know way more about how speciation works. We look, know much more about the developmental biology of a lot of complex systems. Homeobox genes, when they were discovered in the 1990s, clarified an awful lot about uh, homeotic transitions. And so the fair summary is evolution is just microevolution on a long scale. But most of the life histories on the planet are mm, rather boring microevolution that you don't see big macroevolutionary pushes. And, and this is not surprising because animals tend to kind of stay within the rut unless the climate changes or whatever. There's no natural urge or need to change. And so this idea that there might be a conveyor belt of evolution uh, and that, that gorillas would have to be turning into humans if we turned uh, had evolved from apes, uh, no, that isn't how it works. The anti-evolutionist doesn't have a map of time in their head. That's why I make such a big deal out of it. And that's why in responding to them, you need to probe to realize that they don't actually have a time frame sequence where they've got this happening and this happening and this happening. The young earth creationist, of course, theoretically has an incredibly scrunched time frame. But in a practical sense, they don't think about that. Talk about animals. Ah, we have a visitor. How are you doing? You found the spot. We had a, a screw up where I had everything all organized and then YouTube farted and I had to restart in a hurry and I'll have to put all of my links and material uh, up on the system uh, to put on my references and the like uh, when I redo the thing after we've uh, stopped. So that cut five minutes off of the thing. Supposedly, I'm going to be debating this on the after show that Cy will be setting up, Cy Strike, uh, this um, uh, Texas anesthetologist and young earth creationist. And like me, he has written a novel. My, my novel, Paralogues of Phileas Fogg, has time machines and atomic-powered airplanes in the 1870s. Uh, his story is about the antediluvian world where Noah helps fight Leviathan a thousand years after creation. And I would be fair to say that both of us are writing science fiction. Um, I was going to bring up about that bear monology. I've yeah. kind of looked at it and... I'm like, what? Okay, okay, like say, you know, we have the phylogenetic tree. We can like pick a point on it, and based on fossil evidence, DNA evidence, the RVs, and all that stuff that, that, that you know, adds together and goes, this is what it is. Um, you know, we can see what animals pretty much descend from, oh, shoot. We can pretty much pick out the lineages as they split off and stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, and then here's like, you know, a name of this animal, where it was found, when it was found, when it lived, features, this, that, and the other thing. Is there anything comparable in that bear monology thing? Because all I ever see is a thing. Oh. Like a There's no divisions, like no. names for anything. Like, well, here's this lineage, and here's this lineage, and here's that. And the well, other. they basically they basically parasitize the regular cladistic analysis. Um, that uh, they started out typically with 
uh, rather innocuous, low-level family type stuff like sunflowers uh, and try to work that out to find uh, uh, what uh, hollow barramans, but ideally um, they, they tended to find monobaramans, which are an evolutionary subset. Um, in on the reptile mammal transition case because I knew all the data set to see how they would deal with that. And this one poor schmuck, he picked a family that was as peripheral as possible that had very few examples off a third of the data he then ended up saying aha this is a created kind he's identified an actual barrowman but even the material that he had cited you could see that if he'd included that data that he was parsing that it was spilling over into things outside the supposed fixed kind so it, it, this is just a mess of uh, the, the 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 most spectacular failure sequence that uh, a Wood and Kavanaugh and the bunch uh, basically look through. Because well, let, let me explain what they're doing in baromenology. The cladistic data, if you're familiar with cladistic analysis, there's a whole bunch of character states. And these things will go on for page after page, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of these things, where it might read zeros, uh, one, two, as the character states for a particular tiny little bone. And if it's uh, not present, it's zero. If it's slightly bent up, it's a one. And if it's kind of curved forward, it's a two, something like that. And it varies by character state. And what you do is you can plug all of these data into the, the algorithms and you can work out parsimonious phylogenies where the minimum amount of changes are occurring within the lineage and that's helping test out relationships because the, the cladistic itself doesn't assume anything about evolution at all. It doesn't require that you even be dealing with living objects. You can do cladistic analysis on doorknobs or, or uh, 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 cars or, or rocks, anything. It's so long as you can provide numerical states to describe the components you can analyze and classify. So um, they take this raw material. They didn't come up with the data themselves. They're just parasitizing off of it. And they put it into a new set of formulas where basically they're graphing it all geometrically. And the theory is that if you've got two blobs of data of where one animal is one kind and another in group is another, there's going to be a big hole in between the two. There's going to be a, a big cluster of stuff that's going to like be a fog of this geometric thing, and then there's going to be a big hole, and then there will be the other blob, and that means you've got separate barriments. Um, so the blobs actually connect up together. Then you got like a monobaramin, that there would be an evolutionary lineage within a presumed larger kind. And so if they, um, if you parse the data set down enough, you can theoretically encounter these things that their formula will show the gap. But if they're removing data to do it, the horse sequence was the obvious problem because there was so much data available that when they plugged it in for Racketherium that's about the size of a collie dog, uh, all the way down to Equus, that, that there were no gaps. It was just one overlapping, overlapping through Dinohippus, Mesohippus, and blah, blah, blah. Uh, so they basically said, oh, the horse sequence is a monobaramin. In other words, there's a potential bigger horse baramin out there that the all the existing fossils that we have in the horse evolution sequence are a subset of as a natural branching lineage. So all the times that the creationists have insisted that there is no evidence for the horse sequence as an evolutionary sequence, the baromenologists have just acknowledged, no, they're related by natural branching common descent as a monobaromen. Uh, that's what makes it so hilarious when Ken Ham uh, is still insisting there's a problem with the horse sequence at the same time his museum is praising the baromenologists who have conceded the horse sequence as a monobaromen. There's just no comparison. They're not connecting notes. Now, you've got Heracotherium to Equus, where you lose toes and you've got changes in the tooth structure and all the other kinds of things over the course of millions of years. Now, at the same time as Heracotherium, there's this little critter called Homo gallax, which is really, really similar to it. That's the base of the tapers. Now, if you can go all the way from Heracotherium to Equus as a monobaramin, how can you keep Heracotherium from connecting up with Homo gallax? And therefore, by the same element, horses and tapers are a kind. 
And then if you include phenacodonts, the ancestral group from which Caracotherium and Homo gallax are developing, pretty soon you've got giraffes and artiodactyls and all of this stuff knocking around and um, pretty squishy. Now from evolution, everything is one gigantic monobaramin. Everything alive is a monobaramin. It's just a matter of how you go looking at it. So the only way that they can create artificial kinds is if the fossil record has been lucky enough to have obliterated most of the data, or they're a form that's extremely rare and doesn't have a fossil record at all, uh, they flush a bunch of the data down the tubes, which they often have to do. Um, this is not a recipe for sound taxonomy, <laughs> because the goal is to explain all the data. A mammal transition is a fun one, but, there, but it's everywhere. I mean, try even looking through the proboscideans, the elephant group. Try looking through the plethora of cetaceans that we've got now, that it's a glut of data. And I don't know of anybody, especially the ones that have pretensions to paleontological expertise, who ever really dive into this at a level that suggests that they're really wanting to explain all the data. And there is my soapbox. Yeah, because when you look at when you look at what the stuff we have now, I mean, I'm under the impression that the fossil record is just a tip of the iceberg with all the different forms that look. Of course, this would be like saying, yeah. "Me, my father, my grandfather, my great grandfather, we would be different forms." You could say, you know, it's like mm -hmm. how I look at speciation as kind of a time and location thing, dependent on time and location. You know, in a way, and it's like we we call these mm -hmm. things now, so we're different species or whatever. For the hard, the hardest thing for me to do conceptually, and I assume most other people have the same difficulty, is to get a sense about what's going on in evolution. Requires you to think in a non-linear and very multi-layered, multitasked point of view. To imagine every single cell in your body is having little mutations, and then of course your somatic cells theoretically can have a mutation during the the, the sexual reproduction. And so you have a genetic mix that's representative of you, some of which are your selfish genes and others aren't. Every single member of the, of the population, however, is doing that same thing, mix of which there are some breeding populations and there are layers dependent upon um, a geographical relationships, depending upon how broad it is, plus you've got the layer of all the parasites that you have and what the animals that you are eating or the plants you are eating and their parasites and interactions and then all the animals that are eating you potentially and their parasites and interactions. And then all of that is a huge multidimensional non-linear relationship that's being changed by the fact that the land is moving and climate shifts over time. And so rain patterns and droughts occur and asteroids come in and volcanoes do their shtick. So now you have yet another level and yet another level to where you now get up into the question that's usually described as evolvability. Uh, my suspicion, for example, jumping back in the Cambrian, is why were there so many phyla, so many of them die out? Well, when you have a new mix opening up and a new ecological mix and, and you have the early stages of where these homeobox genes are developing organisms that got little fiddly bit parts and eyeballs and all this new stuff. And, and you get this proliferation of models that some of them are going to be temporarily very successful because they meet the short term needs of their environment. Uh, if you look at the Burgess Shale, for example, there's a stretch of it where there's just Morella up the yin yang. They're a little teeny buggy thing that's about the size of your fingernail. Uh, and they're very, very prominent. But you go farther up the, the slope, and they're almost invisible. So you have little deems and population mixes and all of that stuff. Well, Morella is extinct out of the Cambrian, as far as anybody can tell, that there were a whole phyla that didn't quite make the cut. So what the one is that, that the phyla that seem to do better are like the Model T Fords of living systems. They may not be perfect, better in all circumstances, but it turns out they may be a little more resilient when you have mass extinction events, where you have predator-prey relationships. They've got a little edge that you didn't know to begin with, but nature weeds that out. Nature will automatically work out the things. So you end up with, with the stuff, it's the cliche of the survival of the fittest, but it's the survival of the survivors. 
And so the argument would be that the phyla that have shown the test of time, our chordate phyla, for example, a bunch of the arthropod phyla, um, are ones that have just a bit more edge on things uh, in the long term. Now, trilobites as a phylum, or were they a phylum? Were they a class within another phylum? We don't have enough data to go on in the early stages to tell. Ah, there you go, more of that taxonomical ambiguity. But let's assume for the sake of argument that they're a full, full phylum. It lasted a long time, hundreds of millions of years. I mean, that's not a bad run. Actually petered out. Dinosaurs are a fabulous example. Uh, that, that the terrestrial dinosaurs are one of the most successful vertebrate groups ever. They dominated their landscape for 150 million years. That's a long time. And yet, when the system fell apart, only a tiny, tiny cluster of those dinosaurs made it through. And every single one of them was the ones that were covered with feathers and could fly. They made it through without a problem. It eventually proliferated again. 9,000, 10,000 species of birds. Birds dominate their landscape in the way the dinosaurs did before. You try finding too many bats that can compete with a bird head on. That you find bats tend to be operating in nocturnal niches or in places where birds didn't get there first. And so birds are damn successful. But all the non-bird dinosaurs checked out. Even little itty bitty ones. So were they just the luck of the draw? Or was there ultimately an evolvability factor where it finally caught up with them? That's still an open question. We don't know enough about the issues to find out. We don't have the genes of dinosaurs to look at. We can infer some things retroactively through the genomes of birds, but there's only so much you can do. Uh, theoretically, some super duper science from 10,000 years from now, though, may know so much about it that they can literally retro engineer um, uh, uh, conceptually a dinosaur. And then they can actually play out evolution games uh, experimentally if you reach that level. Um, whether or not that's theoretically possible, I don't know. And clearly, I won't live that long because uh, we're talking way super duper super science. Let's go look over in the things because we may have been questioning stuff. There, there, there's a thing about. Well, I'm looking through the thing. You can be, uh, organisms can be too specialized, like whales. Mm -hmm, yeah. Yeah, there's no going okay, back. Saber to the chain, real change for them or no going back. And hi even mentioned it too. He was talking about like generalist species that survive well through change. Um, oh. Oh, got jumped up. I but anyway, it's on that as well. It's like basal mammals or, or carnivores or whatever. Like you look at raccoons. You know, animals like that. They have fully functional hands, feet. They can climb. They can run on the ground. They can swim. They can do all these different things. But there's all kind of different directions they can go off in, like the my myosids yeah. were like that. Yeah, which eventually so turned were, into the carnivores. They are but branching they, cats and dogs. But they were open. I mean, there was enough different stuff going on there that they could go off into different niches, as you say, you know, different form. Yeah. Um, there's always the, the short term versus the long term. Saber tooth uh -huh. forms have popped up repeatedly and uh, um, marsupial forms. And they're hyper-specialists because they're aimed at bumping into a particular prey, and they do really good at it. But if their prey goes extinct, so do they. It's no coincidence that most living fossil species, invertebrates in particular, are generalists. Coelacanths are extremely generalists. They can eat a lot of different things. They have a nice low, floating along down deep where there are a lot of the predators can't get to them. They can eat just about anything. And wow, that's a recipe for stability and success. So the idea that they would survive in their little niche very effectively. There's the, the dangers. One of the reasons why mammals who, remember, mammals were getting on the table at the same time as the early dinosaurs. And yet they didn't proliferate. Why? Because the climate was becoming more temperate it, uh, or uh, uh, tropical. It was becoming warmer. Uh, there was a slightly higher oxygen level. And I suspect that the dinosaurs had a capacity to make more bang for the buck from that higher oxygen level than the stupid little fur balls that had to put so much effort into maintaining that body temperature in a way that the dinosaurs didn't. They often had things that were functionally and in the, eventually when we get down to the birds, the birds have a higher thermostat than mammals do. But they're, they're very versatile in other ways. And so um, 
uh, they were very, very successful. The mammals didn't die out. They remained tenacious in their niches. They survived and then began to start proliferating a bit more as you move towards the tail end of the dinosaur period. Some of them got big enough. They were about the size of wombats in some cases, and they were eating dinosaur eggs and small dinosaurs um, in their little niche. And then the big mass extinction comes, clears the deck, survives, has the place to itself. And that's another thing that's very important to measure that I don't know any anti-evolutionist that ever really thinks about the implications of this. If living things are designed, why the hell does the designer take so long to refill the back bathtub, to refill the zoo? That when, when you have these mass extinctions, the only thing that is on the field is what existed naturally. And then only over time do you start seeing the new forms develop. And this sometimes these extinction pulses can take 10, 20 million years. Boy, that's a long time frame. You think a designer who can go from Lucy the Australopithecine to Ken Ham in only five million years flat could manage to do better. Uh, <laughs> cringe, cringe, yeah. Uh, could do better things. But we find the same thing happening in other contexts. Um, we don't have all the data with the Ediacara ecosystem collapse, but we do have surprisingly a lot still inferential that uh, 560, 570 million years ago, the Ediacara system with these weird palm frondy things and Dickinsonia that looks like an ambulatory floor mat. Uh, we still don't know whether they're animals or plants. We don't know whether they're made of homeobox genes or not. They're still puzzling because they're all extinct. We don't know what the hell they're made of. Uh, we have no living counterparts. But when they collapse, there's this kind of hole in the thing when the early phase of the Cambrian, uh, called the, the, the Manichaean phase, when you've got these little cloudinas that are little itty bitty tubes and we don't know what the hell's living in them because you don't have any logger state in deposits. And then there's the uh, um, growing, there's little trace fossils and things and very early trilobites and stuff are starting to show up. And um, Manichaean gives way to the Timotian phase. This is down the road. Suddenly, you've got all over the planet these small shelly fauna, little itty bitty things like shaped like little tiny ice cream cones, and they're they're in Russia. They're all over the place. What the hell was inside them? It seems as though they're extremely primitive mollusks, and they're proliferating all over the planet. Um, why do you have shells? Why do you need a shell? Well, there's something out there that's going to make you dinner if you don't. So there's a hidden ecosystem that we find in the Claudina shells that have little burrow holes in them in the uh, Manichaean phase, and then the proliferation of these shelled fauna during the Timotian phase, and then it fizzles out as you then move into the big Cambrian explosion part, where we now know what was crawling around that we couldn't see before because we got lager state in deposits, and that's where all these damned arthropods are, and most of which are phyla that don't quite survive. Well, if you're talking about a design theme park, boy, oh, and obviously has a love for bugs, but not necessarily other kinds of things. Uh, chordates are relatively minor players on the field. So if you're trying to design things and use the designer argument, why is it the way it is? They don't really think too much about that. They love the creation in the abstract, the wonderful handiwork of God but they don't really like the details. So they tend not to be terribly familiar with the things. I mean, you know, how many of them are really groupies of trilobites or, or uh, anomalocarids or any of the other little critters on there? That, that, and then wonder why did they, so many of them die out? Extinction is the rule of the game. So the thing is, is that you can tell what people value. Ooh, Lagerstaat and Paul the Skeptic wrote the sacred word, L-A-G-E-R-S-T-A-T-T-E-N. You missed the umlaut, but you can't put an umlaut in, in that stupid thing. So it's a word that everybody needs to know because it's a word that describes a very specific thing, these mother load deposits that preserve fossil, very rare hard parts. And they're so rare that they got a special name for it. It's a Lagerstaat. Fancy little German word with the umlaut. And not only do you want to know it because it's interesting, but because creationists don't know much about them. Uh, I once uh, mentioned to Casey Luskin uh, back before he got quite so famous. Uh, I was exchanging some email back and forth with him about the Cambrian. I was talking about Lagerstaten, and he had never heard of that word. 
well, hell, you were claiming to have been studying geology. How come you didn't know about it? How could you even have read anything on the Cambrian or Stephen Jay Gould's Wonderful Life without hitting on that damn Lagerstätten word? It's like, you know, you see a funny term that you don't know, um, uh, like uh, a kinky sex joint in German. You know, you, you, might, you want to know what that means before you go in. You have some kind of idea about what the hell's going on here. Um, so you can tell what people value by what they do. And the fact of the matter is the people who actually do paleontology are almost relentlessly evolutionists. The more they look at the data, it just doesn't make sense from any other context. Uh, if you flush most of the data down the drain, it can look better, but yeah, not if you have a functioning map of time. So the young Earth creationists at least have the advantage that they're having a ridiculously compressed time frame, even though they, even they don't kind of think about it. How many people bump into as a creationist? If you start talking about trilobites or dinosaurs, really connect up in their head that this was something that was alive 4,500 years ago. It, it just doesn't mesh, even though technically that's what they must be believing. Yeah, it's like trying to Jump imagine in. all of the fossil forms that we found, and they're all alive at the same time as lions and tigers and bears and humans. It's going to get real crowded. <laughs> yeah. Over. Yeah, they all would have to be in the same thing. And then another feature that's so fascinating is paleogeography. Geography. That every single slice um, of fossil horizon is a reflection of an ecosystem. It's a reflection of what the temperature was at the time and what the wind patterns were and what their animals lived there and what plants they ate or not and what predators existed and all the little interactions. And that little slice then as you move up the deposits or down the deposits, changes over time because nothing remains constant. And if all of that's flood, all of it has to be in one gigantic booyah base. So how come things get sorted so delicately in these layers that make ecological sense to where you could actually work out detailed wind patterns and stuff? Is it just luck of the draw and people are just making shit up as they go? Uh, and then why would you then be able to predict what animals would be found somewhere else? Um, a marvelous example is Antarctica. What creationist ever sat down geology and was working out what was living in? Yeah, five minutes to go, BJ. Yes, thank you for reminding. Um, creationists would be thinking about what lived in Antarctica. Whereas an evolutionist is looking at Antarctica, particularly during the Mesozoic, and um, it's down next to South America, and Australia is parked over to one side, and we know that there are dinosaurs in Australia, and the only way they could get there is coming down the thing from South America. So they are predicting there would be certain kinds of dinosaurs that would have to have been alive in Antarctica in order to make the natural biogeographical bridge. And surprise, surprise, that we find those kinds of dinosaurs in Antarctica. How come? sorting of the flood that conveniently wants to make things look really good for Paul Serino and dinosaur paleontologists in the 21st century. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I apologize. They pointed out up there where uh, they, were, they were trying to take bets on whether or not I was going to give you a chance to say anything. <laughs> All right, take a breath. Anything. Uh, anything. Ethbos. That's, that's what I, when anyone says, <laughs> would you like to say anything, I will say Ethbos, which is that in, in, uh, in German, something in German. Yeah, Paul uh, Sistrike is hosting a debate with uh, between me and creationist uh, R.M. Huffman in a matter of minutes. So, in fact, I think I'm going to actually have to curtail the broadcast here. And uh, thank you for uh, uh, stopping by and uh, finding me so quickly uh, after uh, the YouTube had its fart. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the discussion and that... Uh, I've helped not be boring at least for an hour and uh, I'll, I'll then rearrange and put the links and crap back in on the thing after I edit it to make it look like the way the first one was that I've now got to delete because the damn YouTube went on. So, okay. Thank you very much, gang. Y'all come back now, you hear? <laughs>